Right, thanks, Andy. Can everyone hear me? Yep, excellent. Okay, so um, first thing this morning, Paul gave us a really great overview of the, of the bigger picture of mobile and some future possibilities. Uh, and what I'd like to talk about now is a little bit about what it's like to be working with what we have today. So let's dive in. Um, a little word about uh, where we fit in the value chain. Um, the mobile industry is kind of dominated by two sets of businesses. You've got the equipment manufacturers, Apple, Nokia, Motorola, Sony Ericsson, those guys. And you've got the network operators. Um, and in comparison with, with those folks, really the sort of applications and content and services industry, it's really quite small. And if you ever go to, um, to the annual sort of telecoms conference in, uh, in Barcelona, Mobile World Congress, you'll, you'll have seen that uh, applications and content sort of until this year at least were sort of upstairs on one of the eight halls behind the pawn and you sort of you could find it if you were really really out there looking for it but you know it wasn't really all that visible and so it's important I think to remember that you know compared to say the the revenue that um, operators make from voice and voice and text apps and, and content are still quite small and there's always been a big tension between these two so sorts of players in the industry they both struggle to get the loyalty of, uh, of end users. Historically, the networks have always had much, much closer relationships with, with customers because you know, they're the guys who are doing all the billing and who you actually buy the phone through and actually provide the service to you. But outside of the industry, real people tend to really underappreciate what they do because you can't see radio waves. You only really notice it when it breaks or when you're on hold to customer services, which doesn't sort of build loyalty exactly. So historically, people have been much more loyal towards the, the handset vendors even though the networks plaster their logos onto, onto the front of the devices that you might buy, people think of themselves primarily as Nokia owners, not, and secondarily as, as, say, Orange customers. And in the last few years, this tension has grown a lot more prominent, um, most visibly with Apple, who've kind of come into the industry and produced a device so amazing that uh, any operator wanted to sell it, irrespective of the fact that it completely is, is unbranded. Um, but this wasn't anything new. Um, Nokia have themselves been launching a set of services under the Ovi brand to do things like you know, syncing your contacts, backing up your phone, mapping, all the sort of stuff that network operators were kind of out there doing. And Nokia are now trying to offer that directly to their customers as well. So the battle for the customers fiercer than it's ever been, but it's not particularly a new battle. Now, one thing, if you read the press, you might think is that this is kind of how, how things break down as far as devices. Apple are doing loads of stuff with iPhone and everyone's got iPhones and then you've got Androids and you know, they're, you know, they're interesting but they're still small and then there's everyone else and that's all those people who've got the old, old devices and we've heard this a few times already, already today. Um, this problem in the industry we call it fragmentation, the fact that there's lots and lots of different devices out there um, and it's not one that's going away. Um, the reality is uh, actually pretty well the exact opposite. Um, this is the same, uh, same pie chart, and I've rendered this with actual figures on, on UK mobile ownership from January of this year. So this is a completely accurate figure. And over 95% of UK mobiles are Nokia, Samsung, Sony Ericsson, Motorola, you know, all of the traditional guys. Now, this doesn't, I, don't, I don't think this contradicts some of the research that we've just seen around ownership in universities, because you might expect university students to, to you know, be more inclined to have, to have the latest devices. But if you're going out to the population at large, this is what was out there in, uh, in January in the UK. Um, so you might think, well, OK, that makes it very, very simple then, doesn't it? You, you don't do Apple and Google just yet. If you want to get reach, you go to everyone else. But within that big sort of you know, majority of, of the pie chart, you've got a huge amount of variety. There's a load of different capabilities. You've got different screen sizes and shapes. You've got different keypad layouts. Some of them don't have keypads. Some have got GPS, some have cameras. they have got different types of network, different operating systems. There's a huge amount of variance within there. Um, and when you're making products for, for mobile devices, you have to account for this variance. So you can't target that 95% as though it's a single device. You can't even just target Nokia handsets. Just say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll handle Nokias. Because they've got three or four different families of devices. And within those families, there's lots of differences. So if you dig into these figures a little bit more, so this is the, the depressing slide now. Um, if you want to reach 70% of uh, UK mobile owners in January, you have to be on 375 different devices. Um, well, OK. What you could do is you could take a lowest common denominator approach, just do something which you know every phone can handle, and that's probably text messaging or voice. And there's lots of interesting things you can do with text messaging. It's, it's still underexploited as a, as a medium. But 
because that's not what my business is about. I'm not going to talk to you about that today. Um, so, okay, so if you, say to, if you say to someone, particularly sort of five, five years ago, if you said to someone, well, you know, how many phones do you, do you want your application or service to be on? They'd say, well, all of them, of course. If you say, well, that's prohibitively expensive, then, you know, 70%. 70% is a nice, reasonable-sounding number. Oh, that's most people. Yeah, that sounds okay. But, as you can see, a yeah, vast number of devices. And that's, from, that's um, eight different manufacturers up there. Now, in practice, actually, it's not quite that bad because a lot of mobile phones only differ very, very slightly. For instance, we've got a, a really quite depressing habit of, um, in the industry of, uh, of making mobile phones for, for women by taking an existing mobile phone and making it pink. <laughs> Even more depressingly, that works really well. <laughs> um, but okay, if you, if you just combine all of these, you know, actually they're kind of the same phone but in different cases into, into what we call families, you've still got 70 of those families. That's still 70 different devices that you need, you really ought to, you know, buy them in and test on them and all that sort of stuff. If they're 100 quid each on eBay, and we spend a lot of time on eBay, um, that's seven grand. And, you know, people don't have a seven grand budget when you're trying to do a, do a, a mobile project. That's ridiculous. Um, and even if it takes an hour to do that, that's two weeks of someone just testing it, nothing but testing. And, you know, often takes more than an hour. Okay, so you think, well, just, let's just take the best. Let's just get, you know, get the top device, the, the few devices that you know, give us the, the best reach. Well, the top one on the list gives you about 4%. And 4% you know, of an addressable audience is, is nothing, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, if you take all of the iPhones together and match them up, it's, it's, it's 3.6. So you know, even there, it's, it's, it's not all that much. And when you're down near the bottom of that list, these things are distributed on a power law curve. So the top few devices are really, really popular, and then you've got that sort of long tail. And as you go down that tail, you find yourself spending you know, an incremental amount of effort, you know, maybe an hour of testing and buying in the device, to do something that gets you a third of a percent of your audience. I mean, at that point, it's not, you're sort of doing it, thinking, well, we need to get to this magic 70% number, but um, is this really worthwhile commercially? What's, what's the return going to be for the effort that you're putting in there? There's a silver lining with all this, and that's that iPhone's taught us, as an industry, a really, really good lesson. And it's taught us that you can reach... And it's okay to reach a small and very, very active audience by, by very, very tightly targeting them. And you can maximize a commercial return there. Now, most of, most of my customers are interested in selling things to people, apps and services. So for them, most of the time, the, um, there are a few exceptions, and we'll talk about one of them, but most of the time, customers are interested in just maximizing the revenue that they get back in. It's not so much about reach. You know, for, some, for educational organizations, I think it might well be different. And for some, some of our customers, like the BBC, you know, they have a mandate to, to reach a wide audience. But most of them, it's okay to go to a very, very small audience and just get what you can from them. And also, we, we should bear in mind that there are lots of companies out there, you know, mine included, but there are, there are certainly plenty of others who have, over the last 10 years, gotten a lot, lot better at dealing with this problem, have evolved strategies and technologies and approaches that, that help mitigate it to a great degree. So, there's a big, hairy problem there around fragmentation and, and mobile devices. Um, we've also got some problems as an industry around um, tariffs and billing. We've got you know, two sorts of customers, pay up front or, or uh, pay monthly ones. And it's a cliche that you know, the, pay, the pay-as-you-go people are all the, the poor people that don't use data services. It's not quite true. but um, Tariffs are extremely confusing, aren't they? I mean, does anyone actually... Can, I, I don't understand what, what tariff I'm on particularly. Um, you've got what, minutes, inclusive minutes, roaming minutes, text messages, bolt-ons, text messages that are outside of your bolt-ons flat rate data, data by the minute, data by the megabyte. And some people claim that these are deliberately obfuscated and made confusing so you can't really make a rational choice between them. Um, and all of that leads to a quite well-known phenomenon in the industry of bill shock. Anyone heard of that one, bill shock? It's, it's where you get a new, a new mobile phone and it's, it does lots of whizzy stuff and you go, oh, this is great. And you're sort of you know, wandering around using the maps all the time, showing your friends, going, oh, that's fantastic, look at that. Oh, I can download games, all that sort of thing. And then you get your bill at the end of the first month. And you get that £300 bill. And you never do any of that fancy stuff again on a mobile phone for the rest of your life. <laughs> and it's, it's, something, it's something that happened. I mean, look, iPhone, one of the really fantastic things about it, ignore the device completely. You can't get an iPhone without getting a flat rate data tariff. So you're protected from all that sort of stuff. And just Apple forcing that through for the industry was, in itself, an incredibly valuable move. And mobile billing in general. Mobile billing is kind of a bit strange because it's about the most convenient form of billing there is. Sending a text message or having a text message sent to you and then it either comes off your, your, your credit or on your bill at the end of the month. You can't get much more convenient than that even with sort of credit cards. 
But at the same time, it's got a really, really bad reputation, thanks to some nasty sort of fairly shoddy scandals around TV voting and SMS and some things like the crazy frog, which you're probably still trying to forget, all that sort of stuff. That, that kind of thing. So it's got a really poor reputation with customers, and they're kind of a little bit worried about it. But it's still incredibly convenient, and it's, it's kind of there, there to be used. So that's the world that I've, uh, I've been living in for the last um, 10 years. Um, yeah, my name's Tom Hume. I'm the Managing Director of Future Platforms, and we design, build, and launch products for mobile phones. We do stuff with a particular emphasis on collaboration, participation, playfulness. And some of what we do is educational. Uh, we're working with a couple of divisions of the BBC right now, um, Bite Size and I think the Raw, I think they're now called Skills Wise or something like that. Um, but a lot of what we do is not education in any way at all. Um, we help our customers kind of deal with a lot of these, these problems around fragmentation and you know, ensuring that your end users don't have bill shock, all that sort of stuff. And we've been doing that for about a decade, which means that we've been through a lot, lots and lots of changes in the industry. When we started out, we were doing apps for Palm Pilots and, and WAP sites, and no one talks about either of those things anymore. Um, we've made an awful lot of mistakes over the last 10 years, um, most of which we've learned from, and we've learned a lot about how to do this stuff properly. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is a little bit of our approach to, yeah, there are some really badly photoshopped people in that, in that picture. <laughs> we did it for the local paper, and a couple of the guys went in work that day, so we photoshopped them in. And then you get a call from a journalist saying, you know that newspapers get in trouble for this sort of thing, don't you? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we approach building um, software for um, mobile phones and show you a couple of examples of the sorts of things that we've done that sort of you know, give you a feel for that. So. Um, it's not enough to build products the right way. You have to make sure that you're actually building the right thing in the first place. And this is where we see um, design coming in, and a well-honed design process. And Apple have done a great job of demonstrating the value that design can, can bring to products. Uh, you know, um, just after the iPhone launched, you, you couldn't sit in a meeting with someone from a network operator without someone standing up and saying, user experience is key, as if that was some sort of new discovery that Apple had dug out from behind the curtain a few months before. I mean, when I first started working in mobile in 99, one of the, um, the stats I remember being bandied around even back then um, was that Nokia, Nokia phones were really, really popular with operators because people that own Nokia phones sent twice as many text messages because it was just easier to do it on those devices than it was on a Sony Ericsson or, or Ericsson it was back then, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, ease of use and, and, and design has always been important for the industry. It's just getting a lot more press these days. Um, and we tend to start our, our design process by getting everyone together physically in the same room. And that's stakeholders from, from our customers, all the different members of our team, from designers, developers, who you know, know a lot about the constraints and opportunities of what can be done, testers, who are the poor guys who have to sort of you know, sit there at the end of the day going, no, it doesn't work, no, it doesn't work, and understand a great deal about the pain points of, of mobile apps and services. We get all of these folks in, and We'll typically run a, a, a day-long workshop where we talk about business objectives, where we look about the audience that we're designing for, we look at any research we've got, go through a fairly structured um, format, and we come out at the end, end of that with an idea of what the scope of the project is going to be, how we're going to approach it, um, priorities, because you always end up with a shopping list that's way bigger than what you can actually afford in these sorts of things, all that sort of stuff. We then co-locate our um, designers with the teams that are actually building stuff, so again, you've got just constant feedback all the way through the process you know, between the two. And so it's not that you're designing a beautiful product on paper, and then you take it over to the guys who are going to build it, who look at it and go, that's not going to work. You, know, you avoid that sort of stuff. And we involve our customers very, very closely as well. We tend to get them, we tend to actually insist on having them down at least every couple of weeks to actually see demonstrations of the product as it goes on. There was a quote earlier about uh, IT projects used to take, take three years, and now it's got to be weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And so you need to be getting regular feedback all the way through the process from the very, very beginning to, to do this right. Um, we tend to avoid doing anything digital for a little while as well. We, we do a lot of work with, um, with sketches and, and paper and index cards and that sort of stuff. So we'll mock up, you can see the sort of, you know, very, very vague notions of, of what a user interface for a product might be. And we can then use those mock-ups in, in testing processes, put them in front of users, theorize about them, all that sort of stuff. The really nice thing about pen and paper is that if you've just spent a few seconds jotting down an idea and it's a rubbish idea, you throw it away. If you spent a day designing something you know, pixel perfect in a graphics package, you're much less likely to throw it away, even if at the back of your mind you're thinking, oh, that's not so good, because you've invested a lot more time and effort in it. And in those early stages, you want to do a lot of investigation and throwing out the bad stuff. 
so we tend to be quite light on documentation and heavy on conversation. Lots of you know, time spent around whiteboards, photos, video, that sort of stuff. Um, and we also make a point of trying to get stuff out there as soon as possible. If this is probably, some of the stuff is probably familiar if, if you guys have come across you know, agile methodologies or Scrum or anything like that. Um, but we make a habit of, of getting products into end users' hands as quickly as we can, testing. At the beginning of a project is, is when you know least about what it is that you're trying to build. And, and you gradually learn more and more and more. And the cone of uncertainty, as they call it, sort of narrows towards the end. Um, so you want to get stuff out into people's hands as quickly as you can so that you can start learning as quick as you can. So a couple of little case studies. Um, anyone seen, seen these before? You're probably familiar with these if you sort of grew up in the UK in the last 30 years. Um, this, this company, they're called Puzzler Media. They're the UK market leader in puzzle magazines. They're about 30 years old now, 35 years old, I think. Uh, they're the, they sell about mm, one and a half million magazines a month, something like that. It's a, it's a big business for, for such a crappy logo, isn't it? Um, <laughs> they're, they're really, really 70s. I mean, they, they, so the, the, the cover's classic sort of you know, Scandinavian model, barn owl sort of thing. I've, I've been told that they tried changing them and sales dropped, so they just went back. They, they really, really know their audience quite well. It's, it's a sort of an endearing naffness. Um, they approached us about five years ago. They were going through a management buyout, and they were looking at all sorts of different um, opportunities for their business. Interactive TV, mobile, online, all sorts of stuff. You know, I've got a great little print business, want to do more with it. Um, and they made a really quite sort of strategic investment in mobile. Um, in that they didn't just dip their toes into the water and try it out. They sort of really, really went for it. And they've, uh, they've seen some good, good returns there. So it turns out puzzles are really, really great um, mobile content. They're small. They're really familiar. Anyone not know what a crossword is? No. Um, they've got mass appeal. And you need to refresh them regularly. These little chunks of content that you know, deliver a little bit of fun. And then you have to get a new one. Hmm, interesting. Um, so we went through the classic sort of design phase I just talked about. We actually watched people playing crosswords in Sudoku for hours and hours. Everyone plays crossword the same way. Everyone um, gets a few clues, then joins up the, the things on the grid. Sudoku, certainly a few years ago, everyone played it differently because it was new. People writing outside the grid, drawing to the sides of it, drawing inside the grid, all sorts of different things. And that completely affected the way that we produce these things for, for phones. Um, and we you know, did some prototyping, tested these prototypes out real users, launched Sudoku. Um, what they did, they, they, they made a kind of strange decision early on, or an unusual decision early on. Most people, when they're doing mobile apps, they'll, they'll produce, make mobile apps, make the files, give them to someone else to sell, and say, just give me a check at the end of the month. There you go, Orange. Take these and you know, see what you can sell. Put them on your portal, whatever. Puzzle did something a little bit different. They decided to own their own distribution. And what this meant was that um, whenever anyone buys a puzzle, a little signal comes into them, and, and they package it up for that customer and, and send off the file, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's more of an investment for them to do that up front, but it gave them a lot of analytics and useful information. And they were doing something completely new that no one had done before, so they needed that info. So, which means we get sort of interesting things like these little graphs out the back. So we were hearing earlier about the most popular time to go online, being about sort of 11 o'clock at night. Well, that's pretty well what we saw. When we first launched this service, we thought that our target audience was going to be um, commuters on the, um, on the train up to work. You know, get on the train, text off, get your puzzle, play it for 20 minutes. So, seemed to make sense. And we, Puzzler took out a load of advertising in, in the national press next to Crosswords and Sudoku, thinking, you know, well, that's where our audience are. Absolute rubbish. People puzzled mainly, well, that might be on the way home, sort of 6.30, 7 o'clock, and then 11 o'clock at night. And you can see when they all have dinner, I quite like that. Um, <laughs> completely changed the way that they, that they approach selling their puzzles. And they wouldn't have known this at all if they'd just shifted the files off to, a, to someone else to sell for them. Similarly, um, we... All the operators in the UK, certainly the, 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 big, the big four back then, kind of had roughly the same sorts of audience numbers. So we thought we'd see sort of equivalent traffic from all of them. The blue line is O2. We saw about double the traffic from O2 than we did from anywhere else. We think that was because they spent a lot of time back then educating their customers about mobile gaming. So who do you think Puzzler went to to do the first portal deal with? Clearly O2, because they could drive the most traffic. Again, they wouldn't have known that. It made a big difference to their business. Um, they've changed their models loads over the years. Um, they've gone from doing direct-to-consumer stuff themselves, from doing press ads. They did some co-branding deals with ITV and, and the Daily Mail, where they produced you know, Daily Mail branded puzzles and sold those, and no one really bought them, so they stopped doing that. They did lots of one-off purchases. They moved to a subscription model. Get your sign up and get a puzzle every day. And that's worked really, really well for them. And what's also worked really, really well, despite what you might hear in the press, is deals with operators. So they've been on the... Um, Operator portals of T-Mobile and O2. They're launching onto another one any second now. Um, and that's driven hideous amounts of traffic. 
Now, those guys have been incredibly painful to work with. It can take months and months of commercial meetings and integration work and all that sort of stuff. But once you're on there, they're delivering really significant traffic, for these guys anyway. Um, they're also quite unusual in mobile gaming. They've got a very, very low price point, I think 50p a time. Most, most mobile gaming companies are trying to you know, sell, sell their puzzles for as much as they can each, da each download. These guys are trying to build a long-term relationship with their customers. Completely different model. Um, and the, the results now, they're doing, I can't give you the exact figure, but they're doing well in excess of 100,000 paid downloads a month. And I, I don't mean 101,000 or 105,000. I mean well in excess of that. Um, and it's a kind of a equivalent sort of commercial scale for them as a, as a magazine title is another way of putting it. So it's kind of like they're adding a magazine to their sort of stable of titles. And they're just launching another one right now. So that's an example of, of someone that's spent a long time reach, um, working in mobile to reach a really wide audience. This isn't iPhone and, and Android. This is, you know, normal phones. So Ericsson's, Nokia's, all those sorts of things. So the next project is a bit more education. We've done a few education things over the years. And this is more about um, the design process. It's quite an unusual one. Um, Channel 4 Learning have a mandate to educate 15 to 19-year-olds, uh, but the slots that they put, or that they've set aside for this audience, aren't the sort of slots that 15 to 19-year-olds are really watching TV on. Um, you know, sort of late morning kind of thing. So they realized this, and they thought, well, okay, well, where are our audience then? The people that we're trying to reach to sort of, you know, teach about life skills. Well, well, they're online and they're playing games, and they're on their mobiles. Okay, well, we'll move the budgets over there. And... Uh, this is a piece of concept work that, uh, that they commissioned from us. Um, it's not gone as far as production, I have to say, but it illustrates some aspects of the design process. Uh, and the um, inspiration from it was a South African experiment, um, or South Af African sort of teaching method, where they get kids in the classroom and they give them all a test tube of clear liquid. And the kids sort of socialize throughout the day. And whenever they've socialized with someone, they sort of exchange a bit of fluid in the test tubes. And at the end of the day, they put this, dye, this marker dye into the, into the fluid, and it shows that where a couple of the test tubes were contaminated at the beginning of the day, now all of them are. And it's a sort of analogy for the, for the network effects and the spread of STDs, that sort of thing. Um, and so we wanted to use sort of simple two-player games to educate teenagers about the risks of STDs in a kind of way that isn't preachy. So, you know, you play a game with someone, you know, it's quite fun. You play it over, over Bluetooth, so you're sort of nearby. It's quite fun, but you run a risk of catching something nasty. The, the, the analogy is, is quite obvious. Most of our team are quite a long way away from being teenagers, uh, unfortunately. So we started out by looking at the available research, and Channel 4 commissioned a hell of a lot of research um, to assist with this sort of stuff, because they're, they're doing a lot of projects in this area, um, and identifying who our audience were, uh, were. So we crystallized the audience and, and the research into, the, into personas, and I think there were five of them, and these are four of them. Um, and we refer back to these individuals who don't actually exist uh, throughout the design process. There's a terrible temptation. If you start thinking of the person you're designing for as the user, what does that mean? There's nothing there that you can really hang sort of thoughts or, or ideas on. If you actually personify them and then refer back to that, um, you know, it, would Charlene use her mobile phone in this sort of way? You can sort of ask yourself those questions and get almost coherent answers even if they don't actually exist. So it's a, it's a technique that we use quite a lot in, uh, in our design process. And then we went through, I mentioned earlier, to... Uh, to do some sketching. And these are some of the, um, some of the um, screens from the game. Just sketch them out on index cards. So we've got a concept and an audience. Um, we've got the uh, cards written out. And we've got a sort of a flow and a, st and a structure for the, for the game. And it's very, very quick. It's very easy. It's very physical. Um, and once we had these, we could, get, we could then do our first testing. So what we did was we went into a local school. And we sat down with a group of teenagers, and we talked through the, um, the product with them. You know, saying to me, what would you think would happen if you press this button? Oh, I think I'd then get a screen that takes me through to show me the game. Okay, yeah, that's, that's what we've got here. Good. Sort of, you know, checking our assumptions and, and validating them, and, you know, learning a little bit about what they thought about the product in the process. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we learned quite a lot. Um, we hadn't anticipated the need for privacy. They wanted to play this game quietly, particularly this game, this sort of game. Um, and if they caught a disease in the course of playing the game, they wanted to be able to read up about it without anyone knowing. And that was kind of interesting, because um, we thought that we would, uh, we would avoid having too much information um, actually within the game. We didn't want to come across too preachy. We didn't want it to be a, you know, play the safe sex game on your phone, kids. Um, but it turns out a lot of them wanted a lot more information about, um, about the, the various diseases in the product. And, you know, so later designs put, put that back in there. And uh, <clears throat> anyone who's got teenage children 
cover your eyes now. You won't like this one. We found a, we had one little piece of uh, feedback. <laughs> which might worry you. So perhaps designing sex education games for teenagers is a bit of an extreme case. Um, but we do find this with much more everyday products as well, like you know, crosswords, crosswords and Sudoku. Um, we, we and our clients, we're not the end users of the things that, that we design. And our collective understanding of these end users often falls well short. So you know, if we do a great job of building the wrong thing, then we've failed. And this sort of approach uh, makes sure that, that we build the right thing. Or at least we find out as early as possible that we were going to do the wrong thing and can it quickly then before it's gone into any sort of ex expensive production process. Um, I've been asked to finish with a few uh, little predictions. And I think one of them in particular has kind of been covered off already. But uh, here's what I think we're going to say over the next few years. Um, five years ago, I would regularly meet people and, they, and I'd explain to them about this fragmentation thing, about all the different phones they've got to cover. And they'd say, oh, that's awful. I'm going to come back to mobile in a few years when Apple and Google have sorted it all out for me. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Samsung have launched their own platform, Bada. You've got Nokia and Intel getting together with their Mego stuff. Nokia have launched Qt, which is a sort of another sort of UI framework. You've got Hewlett Packard buying Palm. Um, the Apple platform is a bit fragmented. Some of their mobile phones aren't even phones. The iPod Touch, for instance. If that's not fragmentation, what is? All this sort of stuff. It's getting worse, and it's just one of those things about the industry that's a bit different from the web and everywhere else. I, I grew up working on the web. I remember what a pain it was to do oh, two versions of Netscape and two versions of Internet Explorer for that website. And now, you know, we're launching products that we've actually tested on 300 different phones. It's just one of the things that's different. The web promises to sort that out for us, and, you know, it's looking good there. But if you're doing stuff today for a wide audience, it's not an option right now. Um, I think we're going to see simpler, cheaper tariffs, particularly on, on data. We're seeing lots and lots of folks get very, very interested in, in using data, and the minute you go flat rate, you use a lot more of it. That creates problems for operators in terms of you know, handling capacity and all that sort of stuff. But there's opportunities there as well for all sorts of different ways of selling it. You look at some of the very innovative things that, um, that Vodafone have done with tariffs, some of the sort of interesting sort of free roaming stuff, or their, their day-long promotions, which I think they've done on Valentine's Day around encouraging people to buy a day's worth of data. There's lots of you know, interesting stuff to be done there. And again, back at Apple, no one's really noticing the sort of tariffing stuff they're doing with the iPad. This sort of no, no loyalty to an operator using a special sort of SIM so you can't use it in, other, in, any, in any other sort of device, and you're paying 25 pounds a month or something for data. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? That's adding to someone's monthly spend for data for a device that they'll predominantly use at home or in the office so it won't use the networks very much. You can see that there's lots more work to be done there in, in, in that kind of area. Uh, I think we'll see tariffs which are simpler to understand, uh, in particular for end users. And the last one I think has been covered off to death almost today already, commoditization of access. The idea that people will get online not using the kit that you give them that you have to fund, but using their own kit, using their own mobile phones, you know, their own laptops, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and that, I'm guessing, changes the economics of some things um, for the education industry. So, thanks very much for staying awake through that. Cheers. Thanks, Tom. That was excellent. Stay there, because there might be some questions. <laughs> We've got a few minutes for questions, so anyone got a question over here? Just hang on a moment for the mic. Uh, Kelvin Gann from the University of Bath. I was talking to you earlier during hey. lunch. Um, you were talking about fragmentation. Do you see HTML5 as a solution to that? Why, yes. Um, HTML5 is currently the best way that we found of doing apps that work across Android and iPhone. In fact, I think it's the only way of doing them unless you buy a sort of expensive commercial product from someone. So it's, it's been really, really good for that sort of stuff. Um, you can't do everything you might want to in an app. I'll give you an example. We just launched something recently. Um, a, an Android reader for the Guardian newspaper. And it wakes up in the middle of the night and grabs your newspaper. So it's there on your phone for you in the morning. So when you're on the way to work, it doesn't matter if you're on the tube and you know, you've got no coverage. You can still read the paper. Couldn't do that sort of stuff with HTML5. Some of the gaming apps, and you know, gaming is tremendously popular on, on, on iPhone and Android. You couldn't do those with, with HTML5. But for the stuff you can do, it's great. Oh, I've just remembered the author of that book I recommended, Mark Pilgrim's Dive into HTML5. Oh, thank you, yeah. Brian. 
Sorry. Uh, flip side to that question, is it now time to be getting rid of our Flash developers? Um, Steve says yes. So is, is, is Flash, <laughs> is, is or should Flash be on the way out? Should we be looking at migration, not just on, in a mobile environment with the iPhone issues, but on the desktop as well? Um, I, I guess it's, it depends what you're using it for. for. I mean, Flash has never really delivered an, a large audience on mobile. I mean, com compared to the overall size of the, of the mobile. Mobile is great because you can so talk about how you've got millions of users, but that's actually a tiny, tiny percentage. So you get big numbers banded around all the time. Um, Flash has never delivered an audience that's, wor that's worth addressing, in my opinion, on mobile, and despite repeatedly promising to. So it's not should it go away. It's kind of it's never been there. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure they'd like to change that. On the desktop, I, I couldn't really comment. There's all sorts of different uses for it, you know, video, online games, you know, mini clips, sites like that. I couldn't imagine them existing at the moment without, without Flash, but it depends. One there and one over here. Tom. Um, I, I don't think it's ever going to get to the scale, obviously, of the phone platform. But what do you think the time scale is going to be as far as tablet PCs and the arrival of the iPad and Android are going to come out with, you know, alternative um, products and what have you? Where can we see that sort of splintering it even further? Um, so, sorry, you're asking about the time frame before these things are mass Yeah, I mean, how long do you think it's going to take from sort of now to um, a sort of saturated marketplace of similar products and similar platforms, but then you've got to rescale up that you can't just use the same apps on a phone. You've got to do tablet versions and what have you. Well, I... I think people are getting smarter about designing things that scale. If you look at a lot of the Apple guidelines for interfaces, they actually make sense at a sort of tablet scale as well. There are a few metaphors that kind of change between the two, like the multi-pane stuff you get in mail. But actually, a lot of, a lot of the apps scale up you know, reasonably well. Um, as far as when we'd actually reach saturation, well, OK, what's the replacement cycle for a netbook? I'd probably look at how long it is between people replacing netbooks, because that's where tablets are really, really competing. Um, and also probably for, for folks that are kind of less, less involved with technology, like my, you know, my parents are ideal iPad, or I shouldn't say iPad, ideal tablet users of, of some sort. You know, they've got no real need for a keyboard or anything, anything like that. So I'd say, I don't know, significant numbers within, say, five years. I'm, the, I'm a big believer in, in the format. Um, I'm more ambivalent about which, which particular device might win. You know, Google will be having a Chrome tablet out quite soon, obviously. Okay, last question. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to beat this to death, but I'm intrigued by the fragmentation point. I mean, you know, I've tried myself, and I congratulate you on staying afloat for 10 years in this, in this world. Um, how do, I mean, is Java a, a, a factor in, in your lives, or, or do you write apps for the native um, operating systems? The, the Puzzler yeah. example I gave, that's all Java. Yeah, okay. I mean, w what we do has, has changed a few times over the years. I mean, most of what we're approached to do right now today is, is iPhone, iPad, and Android. Mm -hmm. um, but you over the last five years, apps. most of our work has been Java. Okay. You don't write Symbian apps or anything? We did a little bit once, but it's, the audience for them is not so big for us. There aren't that many people commissioning Symbian apps, so we haven't made much of a business there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can we just say thank you to Tom again?